The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Mark Kovich. I'm a uh, system spe- uh, sales specialist, uh, a business development leader for IBM, part of the uh, IBM Watson IoT uh, continuous engineering, continuous uh, products uh, organization. Today, uh, we are doing a webinar on model-based interface control documents. It has to do with uh, a uh, model-based uh, systems engineering tool called Rhapsody. Our presenter today is Dr. Bruce Douglas of IBM. Uh, he'll be going through a presentation here. It'll take about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll do a Q&A session at the end of Bruce's presentation. There is a, a question panel in the uh, GoToWebinar control panel there. Just click on that triangle. It'll expand, and you can write a question. It'll come directly to me, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll go ahead and read the questions to Bruce, in which he'll answer uh, for the entire audience. If you'd like a copy of the uh, presentation that's being utilized today, you can get it in the handout section of the control panel. Just click on that triangle, it says handouts. Uh, it'll expand and you'll see a download button. You can uh, download it instantly to your uh, desktop or to your uh, workstation. And uh, it'll come in to you as a uh, PDF format. If for whatever reasons uh, you have difficulty with that or you'd re- like to reach out to us, uh, you can always reply to my automated email that I sent to all registrants of the webinars. And I'll be happy to reply back to you, uh, put you in contact with Bruce or any other IBM personnel um, associated with this product or technology. So, again, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Uh, Try to keep them as concise, as simple as you can. Um, Sometimes if they get way too technical, we have a tendency to lose uh, attention from the other attendees. So uh, we really appreciate it uh, if you can make your questions as simple as possible. So with that said, we're going to get started. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bruce Douglas. Uh, Bruce, you can take it away. All right, thanks, Mark, and welcome, everyone. Uh, so today I want to talk a bit about, about interfaces and interface definitions. Uh, these are traditionally captured in a document uh, called an ICD or interface control document. Now, if you're using model-based system engineering or, or MDD, you know, model-based software development, uh, then there's a, an issue with ICDs and that you've got the same information basically multiple places. And if you change it one place and you have to track down all the other places that it's it represented and change it because these are kind of disconnected things. And so in a model-based approach, you'd like to have a singular source of truth. And that arguably should be the model. And so we'll talk about today about how do we put the information and how do we represent it and how do we get the information out to various stakeholders. So this is our agenda for today. And we'll start off talking about, well, what do we mean by ICD in general? So interface control documents, you go on Wikipedia, it's used in system and en- en- software engineering to record interface information. And this is you know, often drawings and diagrams and tables and, and mostly, mostly text, uh, generally for a project. Uh, there, there, there are standard word templates out there so you can Web documents or Excel spreadsheet templates, uh, and you provide the details and descriptions of the interfaces between systems or between subsystems, typically. Now, the ICD should really only describe the inter- inter- interface information itself, not the system behavior, system structure, system design. That's good to have, but it's not what shows up in the ICD. So, we really want to talk about the you know, logic and functional systems should be described in requirement specifications and, and architectural specifications and design information, all those sorts of things, but not in the, in the ICD, not in the interfaces. The ICD should contain information about size, format, flows, services, uh, description of what we expect, but not really how it's done and the ultimate information detail should be described elsewhere. Uh, in terms of its of its semantic meaning, the interface document is really about specifying how do these things talk to each other. So a typical ICD format document has a system overview, overview of the interface, uh, protocol, and you, there might be multiple protocols, you know, 1553 and, and CAN bus and Ethernet and so on. Um, how you manage qualities of service like security, privacy, and integrity, and any kind of reference standards, because you typically don't write your own protocols. Sometimes you do, 
Uh, but more often, you use existing uh, protocols, particularly data link protocols. You may write your own application level protocol, but data link protocols are you just buy it off the shelf and use it for the most part. Let's look at some common ICD forms. So I went on online and looked for some templates for ICDs, and there's, there's a couple I found that look pretty reasonable. And these these correspond to, to my work. I, uh, before I was IBM, I, I, I worked in aerospace, I worked in medical systems, uh, I worked in, in automotive, I've, I've done a lot of stuff over the several decades that I've been involved in this sort of thing. And so this isn't my first rodeo, I've done this before. The problem with representing these things in text is that it's a lot of work to create. All the information comes from somewhere else. So then you have a problem of where's the source of truth and your problem with dual maintenance. And because they're not directly connected to requirements or design or other uh, engineering work products. And so it's just, it's just managing that is error prone and expensive. So it can be done. People have been doing it for a long time, but it's not cheap or free. Another common form is called the N-squared chart. Uh, now these are very useful as an overview for a set of interfaces. So typically you'll have subsystem by subsystem matrix or system by system matrix. And inside the cells of this matrix are basically the named interfaces. And so it's a good perspective of, to, to have an overview of the sets of interfaces, but it doesn't have any information about the detailed services involved, the flows, their metadata, uh, arguments that get passed, all that kind of information is just not, not visible in an n squared chart. So this is useful as one of the views in an ICD representation. Now, if you just want to do it entirely model-based, this is the view that I like. This is what I call a subsystem interface diagram. So what we have in this diagram is a representation of the, the heads-up display subsystem. Uh, with ports for the connection points, and on those ports are interfaces. So if you look, kind of squint and look at this uh, one on the left-hand side, you got this config port, and it is offering a set of services, the lollipop means an offered interface, called iConfigure HUD, and over on the upper left-hand side, then those are all the services available across interface, which means that the HUD system provides those services to anybody who wants to invoke them. On the other hand, the avionics data port, the next one down, has three interfaces that it's supporting, vehicle management, autopilot, and doors, and those are also described around the, the left-hand side of that diagram. On the right-hand side, there's a COM port, and here we see both provided and required interfaces. So the socket, again, is required, and the, which means somebody else needs to provide it for the subsystem. And the lollipop are offered, I, this subsystem provides those services. And so then by scattering these around, uh, we can get an overview of a given subsystem and what it requires from other subsystems or systems and what it provides to other clients. It does lack some detail and it scales to, uh, to many interfaces and it's very useful from perspective of I'm either referencing or I'm building the heads up display. This gives me an overview of the things that I need to concern with. It's good for cross-referencing. So what do you mean by interface? Well, first of all, let's talk about the kinds of interfaces. Logical interfaces specify logical characteristics of the interface, but omit physical representation detail. Uh, and this can be a system to actor, and actor in this context is just an element in the universe with which our system interacts in, in interesting ways, uh, or it could be subsystem to subsystem. For example, you have uh, a service here, uh, EV, here's a radar track, and it has a parameter called radar track type. Uh, and then the, type, the parameter name itself, the argument is key. Radar track then has a range. Um, it gives you a range to your target, you know, to 10 meters to, um, uh, to 100 kilometers. Accuracy is plus or minus five meters uh, with a lag time of 250 milliseconds, right? We haven't specified the data format, is that shown in a double? Is that a float? Is that a long? Is it a scaled integer? Not described, because it's not relevant to its logical properties. Once you get down to building physical subsystems, you just specify physical interfaces. 
because in the physical world, these things got to connect together. So we take that and we will then clarify that. So here, EV, here's a radar track, is actually an event in the, in the, in the system L model that passes a parameter uh, of type radar track. Physical interface might be a 1553 bus message. And that has a certain bit layout. And we specify at the bit level what the layout looks like. So here's the command word, here's the status word, here are the data words, and so on, to build up that physical message to send it across the 1553 bus. So in this case, the radar track itself is shown as a 32-bit integer having unit, units of meters in big Indian format with a valid range of <clears throat> 10 to 100,000. So that takes that logical interface, re-describes it in terms of the physical limitation. In the logical interface, it was an event. In the physical interface, it's a bus message. In addition, well, these aren't often considered, but they're really important. I consider interdisciplinary interfaces as part of this problem as well. So in the Harmony uh, AMBSC process, Agile model-based system measuring process, uh, we define the notion of a facet. A facet is a implementation of a single engineering discipline. So it'll be software facets, hydraulics facets, electronic facets, and so on. And these facets also have to collaborate. So we spend a lot of effort and time worrying about the software to electronics interface. There's also electronics to mechanical, mechanical hydraulics, electronic hydraulics, and so on, other kind of interfaces as well. We spend most of our time really focusing on software to electronics though. But for example, suppose the software has a memory mapped interface to servo motor. So we specify things like the address, the bit size of the, of the register, the bit mapping, you know, bit zero, uh, zero means off, one means on, it's one to four error codes, um, you know, bit 16 to 24, commanded motor speed in units of RPM times 10, uh, bits 25 to 31 is measured motor speed, it's read only register, uh, units of RPM times 10, right, kind of give a valid range. In addition, we have electromechanical interfaces, for example, talk about uh, a rotary motor, which is electronics, and you have to give shaft dimensions and lengths and diameters and torque input output so the mechanical system engineers can come along and build their parts of a gearing or belt driven system. Right? So they can specify their aspects as well. And these are all interfaces that should be specified. So what's in an interface? Well, these are the kinds of things I think are in interfaces. Services, Arguably the most important, the things that you can request across the interface and how do you do so. But also flows, uh, both services and flows are defined ultimately by types. Uh, and there's also metadata to describe um, other properties like worst case performance or uh, extents, uh, accuracy and fidelity and those sorts of things. And you may also describe physical infrastructure and protocols as well. So services refer to a behavior that can be requested, okay? Now it's important to understand that in the interface, the behavior is not implemented. It's, specific, it's not designed. We specify how you invoke it, and that's what interface is for. Not how do we realize that behavior, but how do I invoke that behavior? So if you look on the right-hand side here, we've got interface package, and inside this interface package, we've got a substance interface package, and inside there we have interface blocks, and we've interface blocks here. One is called um, IACES, which is the subsystem hydraulics to the aircraft hydraulics interface. And we see that it contains both a flow property, hydraulic pressure, but also some services. Uh, request hydraulic status and uh, here's the hydraulic pressure. So those are services modeled in logical interface here as events. Right? And that's shown down below as you pro provided and requested uh, events, event receptions on that uh, interface block. So services should be specified in terms of the service name. Description is really important. You do want to describe what it does from a logical standpoint, from external black box standpoint. This is the controller data transformation that's going to happen. Not how it happens, but what it happens. Given, just giving it a name is not good enough. You have to give it more description than that. 
And you also want to specify inputs and outputs. Those are described by types and the type of metadata. And also it has the kinds of metadata like performance and, and so on. And we'll talk about types and metadata in a little bit. Now, in systems uh, engineering, flows are also really important. A flow is a quantity that moves, right? And it can be information. And so software can exchange information as well as other things can exchange information. But also physical systems can exchange fluid and energy and material. In addition, if it's software, it's fundamentally discrete uh, because we're all building these von Neumann machines, right? Uh, not so much analog computers. Uh, but if it's not software, sort of physical, then it can be either continuous or discrete. So we're talking about water flow. So yeah, you could talk about water flow. It's really, I've got these you know, dihydrogen oxide molecules going down there and I'm doing you know, 10 to the 24th of these per second. You know, okay, you could do that and talk about it being discrete. But really it makes more sense to me being leaders per minute, right? So you can talk about continuous or, or discrete. It's simply a flow name, description of, of what it represents, and, and as well as what the transformation is happening with the flow. Hot water in, you know, cold water in, hot water out, that sort of thing. Correction, it can be input, output, or bidirectional. Uh, typing, information and units and dimensions and stuff, we'll talk about typing shortly, as well as uh, and metadata. So here we see on the right hand side, ACES power to the aircraft power, uh, and here we see it you know, flow. Uh, called a value property, uh, and here, or, or it can also be a flow property. In this case, it's a value property. Um, power input, and it's a, and it's in amperes. Right? So type, a type is a category of values. So you give it a type name. Types, uh, many types, but not all types, have dimensions. It could be uh, the dimension would be like. Linear distance, a linear measure, could be square, uh, an area measure. It can be volumetric. It can be temperature. It can be energy. It can be uh, uh, force, right? So it's a measurable extent of some kind. I'll talk about an extent in just a second. And dimensions can also have units. So you talk about linear dimension. It could be kilometers. It could be centimeters. It could be feet. It could be furlongs, right? As some standard measure along a dimension. And I'm a big believer that you should, if, if, if the type has dimensions, you should always give it units. You never want to have a situation where your satellite crashes into Mars because one team is doing miles per hour, the other one is doing kilometers per hour. Not that that would ever happen, right? Extent is then the set of permissible values in a type. So even if you've got the type underlying data type might be integer, the valued, valid values might only be minus 10 to plus 10. So the extent would be minus 10 to plus 10, even though the representation format allows a much more, larger range. For physical interfaces, you might want to specify format and size. Size is also in the space complexity. And this can be in bits or bytes for, for the software. It can be also physical volume or units. So you look on the... Uh, Right hand side, we see um, these types here. We've got a block representing power status, a complex type, in which we have voltage, ampage, and whether or not there's faults. And that's power status. We also got error type, and that's shown as enumerated types. So I really hate when somebody says, Oh, yeah, I returned an error type of 157. That doesn't mean anything. I want to see an enumerated value here. <laughs> That means what? So I, I'm a big believer in using enumerated types rather than a list of numbers, you know, what we call magic numbers. Uh, they're much more readable. And if you want to match them, map them to specific values, you can do so. But I would prefer to uh, refer to them as uh, using their symbolic names. And metadata. The metadata is information about data. So it's data about data. And interface, Without metadata is, as far as I'm concerned, incomplete. Because there's other stuff we need to know. We need to know the extents. A range is basically a continuous extent. Okay? And so you, you specify a range using you know, a low value and a high value and also kind of a step, if you will. 
that's enough to specify a range. So integers, for example, you know, minus 10 to plus 10, that's the range, minus 10 to 10, is the range of, of the type, and the step is one, right? Uh, precision is degree information. Uh, particularly in, in systems engineering, this is really important to define because it drives downstream engineering decisions. If I've got to know temperature accuracy within a, a thousandth of a degree, that's probably different instrumentation than if it's plus or minus five degrees, right? So really is important to specify how accurately and what kind of precision need this information. The often precision is specified as valid digits of representation. That's not the only way, but it's a common way of thinking about it. Now I use the terms fidelity and accuracy in precise ways. Um, that fidelity is precision of an input and accuracy is precision of an output. It's also known and also defined to be the uh, degree of compliance to a quantifiable expectation, right? I'm expecting 1.3 angles uh, on my Elyon of my aircraft uh, and it's 1.27, is that close enough, right? It depends on the accuracy that you expect and require. Timeliness refers to the quality of being available within useful time, within a, within a specified time frame. Often expressed as a deadline, but it also be done in terms of maximum response time or average response times, right? Performance, timeliness is the kind of performance. Performance is a quantifiable property of execution or behavior. And commonly things like response time, lag, bandwidth, capacity throughput, right? Synchronicity, eh, perhaps less important, but synchronicity refers to the simultaneity of, of, of actions and behaviors. So blocking is a type of synchronicity where you invoke a behavior and you don't do anything. You wait for that behavior to complete before you continue. Okay, and interfaces can be blocking or they can be asynchronous, right? And asynchronous means it's like sending a postcard, I send it and move on with my life, right? Uh, so there are multiple kinds, so there's, the basic types are synchronous and asynchronous, but within that there are subtle subtypes. Flow control. So how do you manage flow? Are there, are there acknowledgements, negative acknowledgements? Uh, this can be done in, you know, electronically, this can be done in, in terms of software messages, lots of ways to achieve that. But how do you control the flow of information? If it's not ready, we'll send an act, we'll send a knack, or we'll you know, turn off our control line that says, okay, you're allowed to send, right? Uh, location, uh, address, alignments, um, can there are the kinds of constraints. So all these are metadata, and you can come up with more examples. These are the common things of metadata that needs to be specified around interfaces. Now, in SysML, the common way you do this, or UML, the common way you do this is with stereotypes. Stereotype is a kind of, it's not quite a meta class, it's somewhere between a user class and a meta class, um, but it's a special kind of element. And they're indicated with WGMA, in fact, it's shown and qualified here, and you can apply them to all elements or just to some elements. For example, you might have responsible party. Who's responsible for working on this thing? And you're going to find it to all, all meta classes, you know, classes, events, states, transitions, actions, whatever, right? Or you can specify this stereotype only applies to certain sets, right? And the useful thing, I think, really useful thing about the stereotypes is that they can carry metadata. Uh, these are called tags, additional values that you can specify. So if you look down below, we've got this um, stereotype called bitmapped and a package called common stereotypes. And it applies to meta types of you know, arguments and attributes and call operations and classes and events and types and triggered operations and so on. The data that it carries is shown on the right hand side, number of bits, the start address, timing constraints, usage, and then the interpretation of the various bits, bits zero to bit 15. Usage is shown in bottom left-hand side. So in usage, we see there's a sample class as a status field. The status field has a stereotype bitmapped. And then right next to that, you see, oh, these are the particular values. So I've shown the description field for this. And we see that bit zero is okay or bad. 
bits one and two give the active channel, uh, actually zero through three, um, and bits seven, three through seven are the error code, the 16 different error codes that it could return, and those are stored in those bits. That's way of specifying the stereotypes that additional metadata to help you interpret or to use or specify those values. So if you're using Rhapsody, uh, there's a thing called the Harmony Profile that comes along with it. And the latest one, version 8.0, uh, certainly it's in 8.2 and 8.3, uh, includes the updated Harmony process that I, that I developed called Harmony Agile Model Based System Engineering Profile. And one of these includes uh, is a qualified stereotype that provides a set of tag values. And you can use them as is, you can extend it, you can add your own stuff to it, however, however you find useful. So we've got this um, stereotype shown on the right hand side called qualified, and it defines you know, bit layout and latency and prohibitive values, low and high range, and space complexity, and so on, and so on. And then over on the left-hand side of that, we see there's a, a surface position of a, of a control surface for an aircraft, like an Aileon or a rudder or a wing flap. And down below, we see that this particular one has a latency of less than two milliseconds, a range of minus 40 to 40, uh, units turn out to be degrees, uh, accuracy plus or minus one degree and precision is a half degree. Right? So I'm a big believer that any kind of qualified numeric value should be qualified. So you know precisely the, the units or if it, if it has if it has units, uh, the range and so on, because again, it's really important in our usage. So where do these interfaces come from? How do I find those? Well, they come up in logical interfaces come up from functional analysis, which is where we analyze our requirements often with use case analysis as a part of that. Uh, and logical data schema, we lay out the data that gets passed as part of that functional analysis, whether they're in flows or parameters on the service invocations. We want to specify the data logically. And then allocation stage, we want to allocate those flows into an architecture. That's all logical interface stuff. Physical interfaces come up and start realizing the architecture. I'm um, doing do a handoff to downstream engineering, uh, the subsystem level. They need to know their subsystem interfaces in physical formats because they're building a physical subsystem that has to connect to other physical subsystems. Let me do what's called the deployment architecture. And that's where we do the mapping to the engineering disciplines. That's where we come up with these facets that I talked about before, software facets, electronics facets, pneumatic facets, hydraulic facets, and so on. And also distribution architecture uh, focuses largely on communication protocols and middleware and, and application and, and data link level protocols. That's where we really need to specify you know, you know, bit layout for, for software intensive kind of interfaces. So in my experience, and, and, and certainly this is true in the Harmony AMBSE process. Most of the system engineering work is done using physical or using logical interfaces. And only when we get down into the handoff, the downstream engineering, do we really need to codify how it's going to be done in terms of physical layouts and physical bitmaps and, and, and physical schemas. So we do logical interfaces, logical data schemas for most of the work, and then towards the end, we start moving into the physical realm. So functional analysis. So use cases are a source of interfaces. So over on the left-hand side, the fact that we've got this actor connected to the use case with, with an association indicates there's an interface there, okay? They have to exchange information or values or flows somehow and they're going to use some sort of interface. We can use sequence diagrams, upper left, uh, right hand side, uh, to express that. And the, the first two flows there are actually flows, continuous flows of power and hydraulic pressure. The other ones are discrete flows. Uh, these are all, I think, events uh, being sent along, uh, showing the interaction between our use case and those, uh, and those actors of interest. 
And then we can use this as a way of defining up those interfaces. So as part of the logical functional analysis, we typically build up this block diagram, which I call the execution context diagram, where the block in the middle represents uh, the use case, and these blo other blocks represent the actors, and the blocks up at the top are interface blocks. They specify the interfaces that are carried between those associations represented in this executable model. As we do this analysis, those get populated with flows and services, right? So that's, that becomes the source of truth of our logical interfaces. That is the singular source of truth in our model, from which we will generate any documentation we want uh, to hand it to other stakeholders who may not be using our apps or models. When we start doing architecture, we also have the architecture. So here we've got uh, the control surface talking to the hydraulics uh, subsystem, talking to the power subsystem, talking to the management subsystem. And these are, in this case, defined by what we call proxy ports. The proxy ports, the services and the values carried by that are defined by interface blocks. And those are shown up along the uh, top of the diagram. So we've got one, the I ACES management to ACES power interface, uh, control surface to ACES power interface, and the control surface to the hydraulics interface. In these cases, these are all focusing on the continuous flows. There are more discrete flows shown elsewhere, uh, but these are just showing the continuous flows as uh, flow properties. And then we use the data schema. I remember talking about the data schemas as we're defining uh, the data passed along these interfaces. So in this case, this is a physical data schema where I've taken a bus message for a 1553 bus and I broke it up into a first word called command word 1553, a number of data words, depends on what message you can use in your application level protocol. Uh, and then there's a status word down below. And these are then fully defined in terms of what we call this bit field stereotype. We've got a bit width and a starting position within the byte. And so you see command word has the terminal address, uh, I think called TR, uh, this is the sub address mode, data word count, how many words are in the, in the data, how many of those instances that show up in the data words, uh, and the parity, right? And so this is defined in the, in the standard uh, for 1553 bus. This is how a physical interface is going to use to carry those logical interface messages we, we defined in our use case analysis. And so as we said before, we can use these stereotypes on uh, the physical interface definition to carry the data. So here we've got a, a, measure, a measure status. Uh, we've got you know, this big Indian format. It's, it's uh, one byte in size. It's, it's at this particular memory address. Um, we've got timing constraints that appears within one millisecond after a request, and we've got a, how to use it, description, and so on. So we can fully define not the interface, but also how to use the interfaces. Let's talk about interfaces in system alpha a little bit. So you don't have to use ports. You can define interfaces without ports. Nevertheless, ports are useful, particularly for uh, interface definition, so I do recommend them. But you can also do things like associations and, and realize interfaces in other ways as well. Now, ports are named connection points, and ports are only defined by the interfaces, the kinds of things that they can carry. Now, SysML has a bunch of different kinds of ports. There are standard ports of, uh, which come directly from UML. These are deprecated, and what deprecated means, it's still part of the standard. So you can use these. They're not going to go away, because there would be all kinds of, of complaints. I don't expect them to go away. But they're not being enhanced. Right? There are flow ports, which just talk about flow properties. And these are typically bound to either value properties or to flows within the, within the subsystem architectural elements that you have. That works, too. But what I actually really recommend users are called proxy ports. Proxy, proxy ports are defined by interface blocks, and they can define both flows and services. 
So both can be defined. And they can also define, you know, nested ports. I don't recommend you do that unless you have a really strong reason to do so. Uh, but you can define nested ports. Uh, so it's a very powerful mechanism, and I, I prefer uh, to use proxy ports. Full ports or internal elements that we just exposed across the interface. I think it's a, just a bad idea, and I recommend you don't use them. Having said that, do what you want to do. Um, if you're using standard ports, bottom left-hand side, uh, they're specified by the set of interfaces that are provided and required across the interface. You have multiple provided interfaces, uh, provided interfaces and multiple required interfaces. Each interface, they can have multiple services. So, um, it's a pretty powerful mechanism. You don't have any flows to worry about. Standard UML ports, or standard ports are fine. If you want to talk about flows, continuous values, then they're weak, right? In, in that way, you can augment them with flow ports. You can just take the move and move to proxy ports. So interface blocks um, can have behavior, can have flow ports, but they can themselves can have nested interface blocks. And interface box contain and can have proxy ports that themselves have nested proxy ports. So you can you can make completely unreadable stuff if you try. <laughs> really, uh, don't nest stuff unless you find it necessary. If you've got some interface with a thousand elements, oh yes, you'll need to nest some stuff to, to manage those things. If you've got ten, don't do that. It's, it's not going to help you. So an interface block contains abstract operations, event receptions, flow properties, uh, additional proxy ports, um, parametric diagrams, you want to add constraints to the inputs and so on, you can do that. Um, and you can specify things in, in terms of the direction, uh, provided and required, pretty common, you know, in and out, you also see in and out uh, shown as well. Um, you can specify direction if you need to. Tables and matrices. So, graphic. I like to work graphically. I find it very useful. When I want to look at summary information, tables and matrices are arguably better, right? And you can build up in Rhapsody uh, tables and matrices, and it's not the only tool to allow you to do this, but it's the tool that we're talking about here, as uh, the one that I use extensively. So that's what we're going to focus on here. If you have a different tool, talk to their documentation in terms of how you build up matrices and tables. So basically, it's a way of representing textual summary of interfaces. You can work, if you want to work in tables, you can. Uh, I generally prefer to work in graphical views and summarize in tables. That's just me. Uh, it's flexible and powerful ways to view information. They're very customizable in Rhapsody. Um, but I have to understand, in Rhapsody, there's a fundamental paradigm, layout and view. A layout is the definition of contents and form of a table or a matrix. The view is an instance of that layout in some particular context and scope, right? So you might say, I want to have a table that shows me my requirements. And I want to show the requirements ID, and I want to show the requirements uh, specification text. Fine. And that's defined. In fact, Rhapsody, uh, the Harmony profile defines that. And then I can use it in my requirements package. An instance of that and the scope of that is my requirements package, where I'm using the view in, a, in that context. And you can uh, also export to uh, uh, CSV files. You can view them in, in tools like Excel if you want, or HTML, right? So there's an option to export to file if you want to. So matrices are primarily used to show different typed related elements. You can also show the same type, but usually different types. So layout is shown up above. In this case, we're looking at a use case trace matrix. So use case tracing to requirements. So every use case uh, is somehow is a representation in some sense of some set of requirements. Wouldn't you like to know what those requirements are? So you can do this in a graphical view. And this is how I usually create it. I'll create a use case in the middle, requirements are on the edge, and I draw in my trace relationships, right? Um, so this case, in this table, we see that it's uh, the from type is use cases, the, the two type is requirement, and the kind of relationship here is called trace, which is a kind of dependency. And then in the view, uh, we define, okay, so in this context, I'm a U in, in the uh, overall package, and the two scope 
is going to be the requ in the requirements package. So the requirements will be all located inside the requirements package. And this shows me then over on the left the right hand side that here are my use cases, and these are all the uh, requirements. And I can also swap rows and columns, which is something I commonly do here, because you usually have many, many, many more requirements than you have use cases. And I prefer the requirements to be the rows rather than the columns. But that's, again, up to you. It's an option. Now, in tables, you typically show metadata or information around some set of elements. So we talked about one, the requirements table, right? And I want to show all the stuff, every requirement, I'm going to show requirements, ID, and requirements text, right? And that's kind of a predefined. I can also define a layout where we see, in this case, an attributes, and I and we see that, uh, so we've got features. So it could be operations or value properties or attributes, and then we show who, what block owns those things. And that's shown in the table over on the right hand side. Now, um, Rhapsody 7, 5, or 8 added this notion of context patterns. Uh, context patterns allow you to uh, really finely specify exactly the kinds of things you want to see in various columns in a table. Um, and you can make them recursive, you can collapse the first column, and you can, you know, it's very flexible. Very useful. Now let's look at some examples. So um, there's kind of a little meta language for, for these things. Um, and on the page where we do the table layout, we have advanced options. You can specify the context pattern you're going to use. So in this case, we specify packages. We'll refer to the packages using the label PKG. And the star means that it's recursive. So you can have packages inside packages, and they'll go all through all levels of recursion. And for blocks, I'm going to show the ports, right? I've also checked collapse first column. Um, and then in the uh, columns, then, we see that we've got the name of the uh, uh, package, name of the block, and name of the port, right? And so look at the realize the table. We show it in the view. And by God, that's what we got. Cool. Now, so one more. Rich than that, we'll see some examples uh, shortly in the last part, which is I'm going to take an example. So we've talked about ACES before, and I've used an example a lot because I put a lot of work in the example. It's an aircraft system that controls a set of about 30 different control surfaces. Uh, and it measures the, 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 the power it connects to internal uh, aircraft and systems like the um, a pilot display, uh, the uh, Aircraft power system, electronic power system, electronic, like the aircraft hydraulic system, and also a thing called the uh, attitude management subsystem, which is the doing running a kinematic model to determine what would I want these control services to be based on the kinematics, the kinematics I want of the aircraft. Maybe in doing a turn, and I will phase different positions of different services to enact that turn. Right. So that's the system that actually does the enactment. That's the, the context of our system here. So in this case, we define in the interface uh, features table layout, where we've got a context pat uh, pattern, in, pattern which includes packages, uh, blocks, and features of the blocks, which can be attributes or operations or receptions or flow properties. And then I also want to talk about the arguments. So uh, if I have got a... Um, uh, a reception, for example, I might have arguments on that, and I want to know what those arguments are. And this is what that table then looks like. We've got our interfaces for here is one called uh, ACES Management, ACES Control Surface is the name of the interface block. And here we've got different services like command to position. It has two uh, uh, arguments the ID, which surface you're talking about, and that's typed by it's a numerator type called control surface. And then what position I want to go, and that's typed by an int, right? And so all of those arguments are then detailed. For example, if you look in uh, the, the uh, update position, it's got an ID typed by service ID, the movement durations typed by a system L type uh, units called seconds. Uh, it's got a configuration parameter. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we moved on. 
um, that's in here's a position. So basically, it describes all these the interfaces in there. And also we build this logic uh, data schema. And so we've got the set of control positions with a number of services, there are like 30 control services. Each one of these has these uh, properties, uh, an ID, measure position, a commander position, a uh, uh, high end, low end, they're allowed, and they're different depending on what service you're talking about. Um, time to achieve position, there are requirements about you have to achieve within a certain number of milliseconds or it fails. Um, so we need to know how long it took, the last commander position took, and whether or not there's a fault. Uh, the status um, has information that we've got our control services. We see those in numerated type. Uh, we've got the uh, date time type. We've got operational status type as well. So these are our logical data schema shown in a graphical view. And then we can also look at those things in the uh, data schema as a, as a tabular view as well, using a, again, the uh, uh, schema for defining the, our, our uh, data that we want to show up in our, in our tables and perhaps the uh, stuff that we have there. We can also look at the physical data schema. Uh, this is when we start doing the handoff. Now we talked about those events. We send an event so the control officers move to this position. Well, that's going to be enacted by a message. And so we define a protocol, it's called control bus protocol mes uh, message. And we see that it's got fields like a command by the length, CRC, sender ID, receiver ID. And then there are subtypes depending upon what kind of data is being carried by the message. If you don't have any data to carry, then the CBP message is fine. And so we get all of these commands. These are all of our different logical messages that we can have uh, is our command by, these are all shown as enumerated types. Right? And then here's our, some of, some of our subtypes. Uh, control data set, we're moving the set of services at once. We've got a movement done message. We've got a move message. We've got a service configuration message. Each carries different data sets. So all subtypes of the CBP message type where they add additional uh, parameters into the message. And then we can look at the logical trace. So we've got logical messages. We've got physical messages. We'd like to know what the relationship between them is. So we'll build a table to show that. So uh, the name of the physical message is shown here, CBP message or CBP hydraulic status or CBP power status and our CBP move and so on. And these are the logical services in a logical model that they represent. So again, those relationships are shown in this table. And then we can also look at the physical properties message. So for every message, then we said, so what are the attributes? What, what type is it? And what are the tags that it carries? What are the metadata tags that it has as well? So that's all defined in this and this uh, physical message properties data. And these can all be put out into a report. And so there's uh, like three or four ways to get reports out in Rhapsody. Uh, there's RPE, which is kind of the standard way. There's also re uh, report, reporter template, um, way of getting messages out. So there are a lot of ways to get reports out. In general, we recommend this structure. You've got an overview, the reference model, uh, scope, and data. This is typically text that you'll write. Interface, interface blocks. These are basically output as a, as a set of diagrams and tables um, showing interface blocks and flow ports, and also the types and classifiers. And, and also the types, type value types, data types, data types, uh, and other more abstract types shown. This is the format we recommend uh, to putting out your report generation type. So in summary, we defined what an ICD was, when information goes to an ICD, why you, why you care, why you want it. Uh, we looked at some common forms, uh, typically word templates, is what we looked at. Uh, then we talked about what are interfaces and what should be in principal interfaces. We talked about services and flows, uh, types, units, dimensions, metadata. 
all the kinds of things you want to put out. How to define those things in SysML. Uh, recommendation was you can use interfaces, you can use uh, with ports, or I can use proxy ports with interface blocks. Uh, they come from logical interfaces, come from uh, use case functional analysis and logical data schema, which is part of that functional analysis. Physical schema come from deployment and distribution architecture, uh, architectural realization, and architecture handoff to downstream engineering to, to, to the subsystem teams implementing those things. We talked about representation in terms of tables and matrices, and then we went through an example, uh, aircraft management system. So you want to know more? I uh, uh, started a website, bruce-douglas.com, and there are papers and presentations and models. Uh, if you want to know the, the Harmony profile and some supporting profiles, those are available in, in the resources section. Uh, there are also forums, so you can feel free to ask questions on, on the three different, I guess there are like five different forums in different topic areas, the forum for topic area ask questions and uh, we can get some discussion there or I'll, re I'll respond to it. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff. Feel free to go there uh, for more information. And now I'd like to return the control back to, to Mark and any questions. <coughs> <coughs>